be crystallized and driven home by the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. The video of the police conduct in this episode, as I said before, is harrowing. When you watch it and imagine that one of your own loved ones was being treated this way and begging for their lives, it is impossible for any normal human being not to be struck to the heart with horror. This matter is being pursued by both the state and the federal government. The state has filed already second degree murder charges against one of the officers and aiding and abetting charges against the other three officers. As we typically do in cases such as this, the Department of Justice and the FBI is conducting a parallel and independent investigation into possible violations of federal civil rights laws. The president has directed me to spare no effort. We are coordinating uh, our work with the Attorney General of Minnesota and as a matter of comedy, the, part, the Department of Justice typically lets the state go forward with its proceedings first. This afternoon, our United States Attorney in Minnesota and the FBI Special Agent in Charge of our Minneapolis Field Office, the FBI's Field Office, will attend a memorial service for Mr. Flo Floyd. Today is a day of mourning. And the day is coming soon, I am confident, when just, justice will be served. George Floyd's death was not the first of its kind, and it exposes concerns that reach far beyond this particular case. While the vast majority of police officers do their job bravely and righteously, it is undeniable that many African Americans lack confidence in our American criminal justice system. This must change. Our Constitution mandates equal protection of the laws and nothing less is acceptable. As the nation's leading federal law enforcement agency, the Department of Justice will do its part. I believe that police chiefs and law enforcement officials and leaders around the country are committed to ensuring that racism plays no part in law enforcement and that everyone receives equal protection of the laws. In October 2019, the president established the first commission on law enforcement since the 1960s. And I am meeting with them later this month and I have been talking to law enforcement leaders around the country and in the weeks and months ahead, we will be working with community leaders to find constructive solutions so that Mr. Floyd's death will not have been in vain. We will work hard to bring good out of bad. Unfortunately, the aftermath of George Floyd's death has produced a second challenge to the rule of law. While many have peacefully expressed their anger and grief, Others have hijacked protests to engage in lawlessness, violent rioting, arson, looting of businesses and public property, assaults on law enforcement officers and innocent people, and even the murder of a federal agent. Such senseless acts of anarchy are not exercises of First Amendment rights. They are crimes designed to terrify fellow citizens and intimidate communities. As I told the governors on Monday, we understand the distinction between three different sets of actors here. The large preponderance of those who are protesting are peaceful demonstrators who are exercising their First Amendment rights. At some demonstrations, however, there are groups that exploit the opportunity to engage in such crimes as looting. And finally, at some demonstrations, there are extremist agitators who are hijacking the protests 
to pursue their own separate and violent agenda. We have evidence that Antifa and other similar extremist groups, as well as actors of a variety of different political uh, persuasions, have been involved in instigating and participating in the violent activity. And we are also seeing foreign actors playing all sides to exacerbate the violence. The Department of Justice is working to restore order in the District of Columbia and around the nation. Here in Washington, we are working with the local police, the citizen soldiers of the National Guard, and other federal agencies to provide safety and justice. We have deployed all the major law enforcement components of the department on this mission, including the FBI, the ATF, the DEA, the Bureau of Prisons, and the U.S. Marshal Service. Their leaders are with me today and will be talking shortly. I thank all of these leaders and their components for working bravely and professionally to protect the district. I'm pleased to say that, especially over the last two nights, the demonstrations, while large, have been peaceful. The Justice Department is also working closely with our state and local partners to address violent riots around the country. Our federal law enforcement efforts are focused on the violent instigators. Through the FBI, U.S. Attorney's offices, component field offices, and state and local enforcement, we are receiving real-time intelligence, and we have deployed resources to quell outbreaks of violence in several places. I urge governors and mayors and other state and local leaders to work closely with the National Guard and with us. The federal government has thus far made 51 arrests for federal crimes in connection with violent rioting. We will continue to investigate, to make arrests, and to prosecute where warranted. When I was Attorney General in 1995, 1992, riots broke out in Los Angeles following the acquittal by the state of police officers accused of beating Rodney King. Ultimately, the Department of Justice, at my direction, filed federal civil rights charges against those officers. As President Bush assured the nation at that time, Quote, the violence will end, justice will be served, hope will return. The same is true today. The rule of law will prevail. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Chris Ray, the director of the FBI. And I have to say, this is the FBI that I've had the pleasure of working with over the last few days, the FBI that I know and love that have really stood up here and performed magnificently, not only here in DC, but around the country and in all their field offices. And uh, their uh, enforcement functions, their intelligent functions are now in full gear. Uh, and I'm confident that with the FBI's leadership, we are going to deal effectively with the criminals who are involved in extremist violence. Chris? Thank you, General, uh, for your leadership. Good morning. This is, needless to say, an incredibly challenging time for our country and for all the citizens we serve. I want to begin by expressing my deepest sympathies for George Floyd and his family. Like most of you, I was appalled and profoundly troubled by the video images of the incident that ended with Mr. Floyd's tragic death. Within hours of his death on May 25th, the FBI had opened a criminal investigation to determine whether the actions by the former Minneapolis Police Department officers involved violated federal law. We're moving quickly in that investigation and we're gonna follow the facts wherever they may lead in our pursuit of justice. 
Mr. Floyd's family, like a lot of families who have lost loved ones in recent weeks, are suffering right now and trying to find a way forward. In fact, our entire country is trying to find a way forward. That's because this is not just about George Floyd. This is about all of those over the years who have been unjustifiably killed or had their rights violated by people entrusted with their protection. When law enforcement fails to fulfill its most basic duty to protect and serve its citizens, particularly members of a minority community, it not only tarnishes the badge we all wear, but erodes the trust that so many of us in law enforcement have worked so hard to build. And when people feel that we haven't lived up to the trust that they place in us, it is understandable that they want to speak out and protest. And the FBI holds sacred the rights of individuals to peacefully exercise their First Amendment freedoms. Nonviolent protests are signs of a healthy democracy, not an ailing one. The FBI's mission is to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution. That mission is both dual and simultaneous. It is not contradictory. In engaging with our communities during these protests, we in law enforcement must balance the safety and security of our communities with our citizens' constitutional rights and civil liberties. One need not and must not come at the expense of the other. In recent days, the violence, threat to life, and destruction of property that we've seen in some parts of the country jeopardizes the rights and safety of all citizens, including peaceful demonstrators, and it has to stop. We're seeing people who are exploiting this situation to pursue violent extremist agendas, anarchists like Antifa and other agitators. These individuals have set out to sow discord and upheaval rather than join in the righteous pursuit of equality and justice. And by driving us apart, they're undermining the urgent work and constructive engagement of all those who are trying to bring us together, our community and religious leaders, our elected officials, law enforcement, and citizens alike. Many have suffered from the violence instigated through these radicals and extremists, including members of our own law enforcement family, officers killed or gravely injured while just doing their jobs, fulfilling their duty to the public by trying to keep everyone safe. To be clear, we are not in any way trying to discourage peaceful protesters. And to those citizens who are out there making your voices heard through peaceful, lawful protests, let me say this, we in law enforcement hear you. We have to make sure that our policing and our investigations are conducted with the professionalism and commitment to equal justice that you all deserve. But we are also committed to identifying, investigating, and stopping individuals who are inciting violence and engaging in criminal activity. So at the FBI, we're focusing our efforts on supporting our law enforcement partners with maintaining public safety in the communities we're all sworn to protect. We're making sure that we're tightly lashed up with our state, local, and federal law enforcement partners across the country by standing up 24-hour command posts in all of our 56 field offices. We've directed our 200 joint terrorism task forces around the country to assist law enforcement with apprehending and charging violent agitators who are hijacking peaceful protests. On a national level, we're soliciting tips, leads, and video evidence of criminal activities through our National Threat Operations Center, NTOC. And over the past few days, like the Attorney General, I've been speaking with law enforcement leaders in various parts of the country to ensure that we're providing the support they need and to let them know that in every community, the FBI stands ready to assist wherever we can. The relationships that we've built with our law enforcement and community partners are more important now than ever. Because the reality is we can't do our jobs without the trust of the American people. I want to close by reiterating that the FBI will remain steadfast in its mission to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution. Protecting civil liberties and civil rights has been part of our mission 
since the days of the Civil Rights Movement. Those investigations are at the heart of what we do for the simple reason that civil liberties and civil rights are at the very heart of who we are as Americans. Before the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the federal government largely left protection of civil rights to state and local governments. And it took the Mississippi burning case and the Civil Rights Act for the federal government and the FBI to get off the sidelines and to begin to fully protect civil rights for all people of color. Since then, we've been working hard to identify and prevent hate crimes and to investigate abuses of power and authority. Our civil rights cases are among the most important work we do, and that will never change. Now, I will repeat today what I've long believed about the men and women of law enforcement. It takes an incredibly special person to willingly put his or her life on the line for a complete stranger. And to get up day after day after day and do that is extraordinary. And in these turbulent times, we won't forget the bravery of our law enforcement members who have risked life and safety to protect the public and keep the peace. But the difficulty of that job doesn't diminish the role we play in society, which is to protect and serve all citizens, no matter their race, creed, orientation, or station in life. And when we lose sight of those solemn obligations to the citizens we serve, the protectors can quickly become the oppressors, particularly for communities of color. As law enforcement, we're bound by an oath to serve all members of our community with equal compassion, professionalism, dignity, and respect. The American people should expect nothing less from us. Thank you. Good morning. I am Donald Washington, Director of the United States Marshal Service. First of all, thank you, Attorney General Barr. Let me begin by specially noting that today marks the first of three days in which the family, friends, and the loved ones will host memorials to honor the life of George Floyd in Minnesota, North Carolina, and in Texas. On behalf of the men and women of the United States Marshal Service and personally, I extend my deepest sympathy and my heartfelt condolences to the family of George Floyd. What started as, as peaceful protests in Minnesota after the death of Mr. Floyd has marked into a national emergency, resulting in many injuries to many people, thousands of arrests, along with arson, theft, and vandalism to property in many cities. As of last night, U.S. Marshals report damage and vandalism to 21 federal courthouses located in 15 states and the District of Columbia. There has been damage and vandalism to many other federal properties. The U.S. Marshal Service is assisting other agencies in efforts to address violent disturbances that have occurred in the District of Columbia and in other cities around the United States. Peaceful protests are good for our country. This right should be respected by all persons, and this right absolutely deserves the full protection of officers of the law. Among our basic functions is the absolute duty to protect people who are exercising constitutional rights. However, rioters, arsonists, thieves, looters, and their protagonists are criminals. They have undermined peaceful and lawful demonstrations and protests. These criminals threaten our basic constitutional rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and they must be brought to justice. Since the earliest days just after our nation's birth, U.S. Marshals have worked to ensure the rule of law by making sure that the federal judiciary and the federal judicial process operate unfettered and unintimidated. We have also worked tirelessly over the years to bring thousands and thousands of fugitives to justice. And today, one of our primary missions is to find and protect endangered children. In the last week, U.S. Marshals have coordinated with U.S. attorneys and state, local, and federal partners to protect protesters and to address the criminal acts of others. 
Deputy U.S. Marshals are assisting with and conducting criminal investigations required by the criminal acts of persons who are instigating and causing violence against persons and property where such acts violate federal laws. Working with our local law enforcement partners, we are also securing federal properties threatened by criminal acts and protecting persons from the violent acts of others. I believe strongly that this special mission is important to our democracy. We will protect those who are engaged in lawful pro protests, but we will arrest those who commit felonies in our presence. We are working violent crime warrants and investigating gang activities that incite riots or terrorism. We are assisting and partnering with federal, state, and local authorities consistent with our broad federal jurisdiction. To our local governments and private sector leaders, we know that we are stronger, much stronger, when we work together. We will achieve our collective goals of protecting lawful protesters and lawful protests while also enforcing the law. I do not pretend even for a moment to speak for the other leaders here, but I am certain that we, are, that we all want local leaders to have the confidence and the conviction to request and utilize all available resources to fight violence and to protect our communities. The U.S. Marshal Service is your partner too. In summary, the U.S. Marshal Service will continue to perform our many day-to-day -day missions, and we will also assist our federal, state and, local, federal, state, and local partners during this emergency. We will work urgently to keep citizens and law enforcers safe. I thank our concerned citizens for their patience and for their continuing support, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Regina Lombardo, the acting director of ATF. For many special agents, one of the proudest moments is when you raise your right hand to take the oath of office to support and defend the United States Constitution. And we take that oath seriously. However, in the moment, we don't know exactly what we will be faced with, what challenges we will have to overcome in order to uphold that oath that we took. In this moment today, we express our warmest sympathies to the family of George Floyd and acknowledge the pain and suffering for his family. We also have sympathy for those that are suffering across the country. Unfortunately, where our constitutionally protected right to peacefully assemble has sometimes turned to the riots and criminal acts, the resulting violence involves crimes of ATF's core mission. Shootings, responding to shootings, burglaries, arsons, bombings, especially destructive devices such as the Molotov cocktail. At the request of the Attorney General, ATF has provided every available resource. We have deployed a large number of special agents, our special response team here in our nation's capital. We have supported the Washington Metropolitan Police Department, the United States Secret Service, and the United States Park Police to protect the public, property, and the national landmarks that belong to each and every one of you. Our national response teams are here in Washington, D.C. in order to quickly respond to the emerging arson incidents. We are working with the D.C. Fire to assess, investigate the seven incendiary fires in the D.C. area caused by criminals, including the arson at St. John's Church the AFL-CIO, the National Park <coughs> Service Building, and the DC Fire District 4 Police Department. The individual we believe responsible for that fire at the Metro PD's Fort District has been arrested and charged. Our certified fire investigators, chemists, fire engineers, and explosive specialists are working around the clock to support the ongoing safety of operations. Across the country, ATF special agents, 
industry operations investigators from all 25 of our field divisions are responding to shootings, arsons, bombings, and thefts of federal firearms licensed dealers. We are providing investigative support and assistance to all of our local and state partners. ATF has responded to numerous shooting scenes at the disturbances of cities that is actively working with law, local law enforcement and we are entering those shell casings into our National Integrated Ballistic Information Network, NIBIN. Our National Tracing Center is running traces on the recovered firearms and we are collecting DNA from shell casings and ballistic evidence. Our crime gun intelligence centers are collecting valuable intelligence and sharing all of that information in a joint environment. ATF's JTTF representatives are working with the FBI in multiple cities, as well as our Department of Justice partners, the U.S. Marshal Service, the DEA, and the, and the Bureau of Prisons, all state and local federal law enforcement working in partnership. Our special agents and certified fire investigators are tracking and assisting more than 847 arsons over 76 explosive incidents and providing valuable technical expertise and intelligence support. Two of our national response teams, our NRT, have been activated and responding to Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota. We have developed efficient and effective strategies to triage and quickly assess the scenes even in an unstable environment. ATF has also responded to 73 federal firearms licensed dealers. We have identified many suspects and made arrests and recovered many firearms already. We have responded to assaults and murders of our law enforcement partners. Our team of ATF professionals at our National Correlation Center and our laboratories and our tracing center are all working day and night to make those arrests. We are on the streets, making cases, and protecting the American public from violent criminals. You do not have to be in law enforcement to know that this is dangerous work. ATF has answered the call. As the Attorney General stated, the most basic function of government is to provide security for the people who live their lives and exercise their rights, and we will meet that responsibility. This is our mission and we deeply are committed to that mission to protect and serve. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Michael Carval, the director of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. The Bureau of Prisons staff are federal law enforcement officers who are often called upon to assist during crisis situations within our communities. The Attorney General asked the BOP to request and assist other law enforcement agencies in maintaining order and peace in the District of Columbia. BOP crisis management teams are highly trained to deal with various types of emergency situations, including crowd control and civil disturbances. They are experienced in confrontational avoidance and conflict resolution. In the aftermath of the tragic death of George Floyd, it is unfortunate that these services are necessary. On behalf of the BOP and its 36,000 staff, I extend our greatest sympathies to the family for his loss. We also respect the rights of the public to express their frustration and grief. We appreciate those who seek to ensure the events surrounding Mr. Floyd's death are never repeated again. It's shameful those voices are being drowned out by those seeking to incite violence and destroy property. I'm proud of the work our staff do every day to keep our institutions safe and I'm honored that they were called upon to assist our communities. Thank you. My name is Tim Shea. I'm the acting administrator of the Drug Enforcement Administration. And I'm honored to represent the brave men and women of the DEA and to share with you the important work our special agents have been performing these last few days. But first, I'd like to join the Attorney General and, and take a moment to express my sincere condolences on behalf of myself and, and the uh, men and women of the DEA to the family 
uh, and friends of George Floyd, as well as to all those who mourn his passing. It was a tragedy for us too in law enforcement. The DA's mission, like all law enforcement partners, is to protect the American people. Before they receive their badge and credentials, every one of our special agents takes an oath to uphold the Constitution and the rule of law. And that's exactly what they're doing this week. As is the case with other significant events, our agents have been authorized to respond as needed to violations of federal law. And I'm proud of what our agency has done to assist our state and local partners to ensure that those who wish to peacefully protest may do so in safety and without fear of violence. While these events have been largely peaceful, agitators continue to attempt to sow chaos. We've recovered weapons. We've had rocks thrown at our vehicles. And our agents, along with other law enforcement partners, have endured the continual verbal assaults. And during that time, our agents have acted professionally and admirably under these very difficult conditions. DEA special agents are providing security, conducting threat assessments, sharing that information on potential violations of, of federal law in real time. In addition, DEA continues to investigate drug-related crimes, including the theft of controlled substances from looted pharmacies, which is happening here in the District of Columbia and across the country. In the National Capital Region, approximately or over 150 DEA special agents have partnered with the Metropolitan Police Department at their request and the National Guard to enforce security posts and maintain a, se a secure perimeter in designated areas. DEA has also provided over 11 mobile response teams, SRT teams, who are prepared to respond to high-risk situations and other requests for assistance, including medical services. DEA owes much of its success in enforcing our nation's drug laws to the assistance provided by the very federal, state, and local partners that need our help now. Every DEA agent out on the street helps free up one of our local law enforcement counterparts, in, this, in the case of Washington, the MPD, to carry out their policing functions and protect the public. DEA is committed to providing that support as long as it's needed, requested, and authorized. Our country was founded upon basic principles and rights, and, among, and chief among them is the right of free speech and the right to assemble peaceably. We're supporting those rights and the peaceful demonstrators by, enduring the, by ensuring their voices can be heard and that those seeking to exploit this situation are held to account. Thank you. Thank you, and, and with that, I'll, I'll open it up to, uh, to questions. Thank you. To ask a question, you may press star one. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, let's start with one to ask a question. And today's first question comes from Pete Williams with NBC News. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Attorney General. Uh, Washington, D.C. has a lot of experience in dealing with large, complex events that include protests like the inauguration or meetings of the World Bank. Why did you think it was necessary for you to take command of this, and where does that authority come from? Well, I, I think the, the rioting uh, got going, I think, on Friday, May 29th, and uh, got worse and worse over the weekend. Uh, it culminated uh, or came to a crescendo over the weekend on, on Sunday evening right around the White House on, on H Street uh, on the northern side of Lafayette Park. And uh, it was very serious uh, rioting. Uh, the Treasury Annex, Treasury Department Annex there was broken into. Uh, a historical building on, on Lafayette Park, which is federal property, was burned down. There was a fire set at the historical uh, St. John's Church right there uh, across from the White House. Uh, and uh, an old church that goes back to the uh, 18th century and is referred to as the Church of Presidents. 
Uh, the uh, rioters used crowbars to dig out the pavers uh, at Lafayette Park and use them as projectiles thrown at Secret Service and other uh, federal agents. There were numerous head injuries among uh, the federal personnel whose rep responsibility uh, is to protect the White House. Just to give you an indication, but from Saturday until today, and virtually uh, oh, the, the lion's share of these injuries came over the weekend, there were 114 uh, injuries to law enforcement, most of those to federal uh, agents and most of those inflicted right around the White House. There were 22 hospitalizations and most of those were serious head injuries or concussions that required uh, monitoring and treatment. Uh, on Monday, uh, the President asked me to coordinate uh, the various federal law enforcement agencies, not only the multiple Department of Justice agencies, but also other agencies such as uh, those in, in the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, so we had a coordinated response and worked with the National Guard uh, and uh, also uh, with uh, the DC police. That morning, uh, we decided uh, that we needed more of a buffer uh, to protect the White House and, and to protect our agents uh, and Secret Service personnel who uh, could be reached by projectiles from H Street. Uh, I made the decision that we would uh, try to move our perimeter uh, northward by a block to provide this additional protection. And uh, later at 2 o'clock on Monday, I met with all the various law enforcement agencies and we set our tactical plan, uh, and that plan uh, involved moving uh, our, our perimeter a block north uh, to I Street. It was our hope to be able to do that uh, relatively quickly uh, before uh, many demonstrators appeared that day. Unfortunately, because uh, of the uh, difficulty in getting appropriate forces uh, uh, units uh, into place, uh, by the time they were able to uh, uh, move our perimeter up to I Street, there had been a number, a large number of uh, protesters had assembled on H Street. There were projectiles being uh, thrown and uh, the group uh, was becoming increasingly unruly uh, and uh, the uh, operation, to, they were asked three times if they would move back one block. Uh, they refused and uh, we, we proceeded to, to uh, move our perimeter out to uh, I Street. The, it is true that the uh, Metropolitan Police uh, have a lot of experience in dealing with demonstrations. Uh, but we have a lot of uh, federal, pro this is the federal city. It's the seat of the federal government. Many of the buildings, as you know, and facilities here uh, and the monuments are, are the responsibility of the federal government and the proceedings and process of the federal government take place here. And so when you have a large scale civil disturbance that is uh, damaging federal property, threaten threatening federal property, threatening federal law enforcement officers, uh, threatening uh, the officials uh, in government uh, and their offices uh, and our great monuments. Uh, it is the responsibility of the federal government to render that protection and we do so in close coordination uh, with the uh, Metropolitan Police Department. Uh, fortunately, uh, later that evening on Monday after we did establish uh, a buffer zone, the, uh, we were able to uh, finish that day without further significant um, violence uh, from the demonstrators. And then the following two days uh, were peaceful. The assemblies and the protests were peaceful. Uh, so uh, we're pleased with that. We're working closely with the Metropolitan Police uh, to plan out the remainder of the, of the week. Next question. 
Our next question comes from Pierre Thomas with ABC News. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Attorney General Barr. A uh, couple of very good questions for you, if I may. Uh, yesterday, the department charged three members of the group or associated with the group Boogaloo, uh, a far-right extremist group known as a far-right extremist group. Is it important in your remarks and thoughts to point out all the different groups that are involved in uh, this type of violent activity? And then the second question is, do you have any concerns that law enforcement could have perhaps been more surgical in how they operated on Monday? And uh, many of the people who were moved forcibly were peaceful pro protesters, sir. Well, I, I do think it's important to, to point out uh, the, the uh, witch's brew that we have of extremist uh, individuals and groups that are involved, and that's why in my prepared statement I specifically said, in addition to Antifa and other extremist groups like Antifa, there were a variety of, uh, of uh, groups and, uh, and uh, people of a variety of uh, ideological persuasion, so I did make that point. The, you know, I'm not going to get uh, too specific, but uh, uh, the intelligence uh, being collected uh, by our U uh, U.S. Attorney's Office is particularly integrated by the FBI from multiple different sources is, is building up. Uh, there are some specific cases against uh, individuals, uh, some Antifa-related. Uh, a lot of the extremists are involved in um, egging on violence uh, and uh, participating in violence, providing the means of violence. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are pursuing those cases at the same time. Uh, there's a lot of, I would also add, there's a lot of disinformation out there, uh, people posing uh, as different, uh, as their members of the different groups. So you sometimes have to dig a little deeper to determine exactly what's going on. Uh, and uh, there are some groups that don't have uh, a particular ideology other than anarchy. There are some groups that uh, want to bring about a civil war, the Boogaloo group, uh, uh, that has been on the margin of this as well, uh, trying to exacerbate the violence. Uh, so we are dealing with, as I say, a witch's brew of a lot of uh, different extremist organizations. Uh, maybe Chris uh, would have something to, to add to that. Sure. I mean, uh, let me say first, as I've said uh, for quite some time, and including even my first few months uh, in the job, we, the FBI, have quite a number of ongoing investigations of violent anarchist extremists, uh, including those motivated by an Antifa or Antifa-like ideology, and we categorize and treat those as domestic terrorism investigations and are actively pursuing them through our joint terrorism task forces. In the course of the current unrest, uh, while the majority of the protesters are peaceful, uh, there are certainly instigators, agitators, and opportunists seeking to exploit these demonstrations to commit violence or rioting. And exactly who these people are, who's driving them, what's driving them, what tactics they use varies uh, widely sometimes from city to city, sometimes even from night to night. Uh, and we're working with all of our law enforcement partners to gather uh, as much information as we can about that topic uh, and to bring federal charges where appropriate uh, and possible. Um, so we're about the violence, we're not about the ideology. Uh, and it doesn't matter what your ideology are, it is, if you commit violence or rioting or uh, acts that we would consider terrorism, we're going to pursue it. The second, the second part of your question, Pierre, I mean, one of the difficulties is that uh, while there are peaceful demonstrators and participants in these uh, protests, uh, it is uh, the, the instigators, those committed to violence, uh, basically shield themselves by going among them uh, and carrying out acts of violence. Those projectiles, I saw the projectiles on Monday when I, was, I went to Lafayette Park uh, to uh, look at the situation, 
And uh, as one of the officials said, that there are, he pointed out various knots of people where the projectiles were coming from, and we could see, and it was a lot of uh, demonstrators. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's hard to uh, uh, know exactly where they're coming from. Frequently, these things are thrown from the rear of the, of the demonstration. Uh, but uh, we could not continue uh, to uh, protect the federal property involved uh, and protect the safety of our agents with such a tight perimeter. And so our object was to move it out by one block. Any, uh, the next question, please. Our next question comes from David Spunk with Fox News. Please go ahead. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Attorney General. Um, yesterday, your colleague over at the Department of Defense, uh, Secretary Esper, expressed some regret in the way that things were handled at uh, Lafayette Park, Lafayette Square, uh, posing in a picture with President Trump, said he wants to stay apolitical, stay out of things. As you mentioned, you had this job in 1992. You saw this during the Rodney King riots. Um, w w what do you think about politics, and, and, and do you believe that you're being too political in this by, by standing in a picture with the president in front of the church? What is your take on this compared to what you know Secretary Esper said? Yeah, I, I don't know what what uh, what he was conveying there. Uh, obviously, uh, my interest was to carry out the law law enforcement functions of the federal government and to protect. Uh, federal uh, facilities and federal personnel, uh, and also to uh, address the rioting uh, that was interfering with uh, the government's function. And uh, that was what we were doing. Uh, I think the president uh, is uh, the head of the executive branch, and uh, the chief executive of the nation and should be able to walk outside the White House and walk across the street to the Church of Presidents. Uh, I don't necessarily view that as a political act. I think it was entirely appropriate for him to do. I did not know that, uh, that he was going to do that until later in the day uh, after our plans were well underway to, to move the perimeter. So there was no correlation between uh, our, our, our tactical plan of moving the perimeter out by one block uh, and the president's uh, going over to the church. The president asked members of his cabinet to go over there with him, the two that were present, and uh, I think it was appropriate for us to go over with him. Next question. Thank you, sir. Our next question comes from Mike Balsamo with the Associated Press. Please go. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General. Can you expand a little bit on your comments that uh, foreign actors are responsible uh, or working to exploit all sides here? Um, and do you believe that's an organized disinformation effort from a foreign government? And, and have you identified, you know, which countries are responsible for that? And then I have a, a separate question for Director Carvajal, if I could, right, right after that. Okay. Uh, I may ask, ask Chris if, if he cares to provide a little more detail. I'm not sure how much detail we want to get into, but people shouldn't think that uh, countries that are hostile to the United States, uh, that their efforts to influence the U.S. or weaken the U.S. or sow discord in the U.S. is something that goes, comes and goes with the election cycle. It is constant. And uh, they are constantly trying to so discord among our people, and there's a lot of disinformation uh, that circulates that way. And I believe uh, that we have uh, evidence uh, that some of the foreign uh, hackers and, and groups that are associated with foreign governments are uh, focusing in on, on this particular situation we have here and trying to exacerbate it in every way they can. Um, Unless Chris has something to add, I can turn it over to you. Yeah. Not a, not a whole lot that I can say here, uh, other than to say that it is unfortunately not unusual for foreign actors to choose to try to amplify uh, events in this country uh, to sow divisiveness and discord, and in particular, through the use of uh, state-associated media from some of those countries, but also social media provides 
a bullhorn or an amplifier to gin up more controversy where controversy may already exist uh, and to try to generate upheaval in that regard. Uh, and those foreign actors should know that we're watching it extremely closely uh, and are prepared to act if necessary. And, and, <clears throat> and what's your question for Mr. Uh, Carball? Uh, Director, can you uh, address some concerns uh, that have been raised in the last few days about the BOP, specifically that some officers stationed around D.C. Um, have said that they've been specifically told not to tell people that they work for the federal government? Um, and last night we learned an inmate at the MDC in Brooklyn had died after uh, officers used pepper spray on him after he barricaded himself. Um, do you have concerns there that, that non-lethal force resulted in someone's death? Thank you, uh, Mike, for the question. And let me uh, clarify this. First of all, uh, I'm not aware of any specific uh, Bureau of per Prisons personnel being told not to identify themselves. What I attribute that to is probably the fact that we normally operate within the confines of our institution and we don't need to identify ourselves. Most of our identification is institution specific and probably wouldn't mean a whole lot to people in D.C. Uh, I probably should have done a better job of uh, marking them nationally as the agency. Uh, point is well taken, but I assure you that no one was specifically told in my knowledge not to identify themselves. As for your question regarding the incident at MDC Brooklyn, uh, what I can tell you, we did do a press release with the uh, information in there. Uh, it was, as you stated, an incident involving a disruptive uh, individual uh, down in, in a cell. Uh, the officers uh, did utilize pepper spray, as you say, OC, uh, and afterwards the individual unfortunately died. What I will tell you is that we immediately uh, referred, the in, the, referred the case to the FBI and the Office of the Inspector General. I was ap actually told, notified this morning that the Officer Inspector General is going to take that case. Uh, and that's about all I can comment on because the matter is under investigation. Let me just add that uh, the uh, Bureau of Prisons sort teams are, are uh, used frequently for emergency response and in emergency situations and either civil disturbances or hurricanes or other things like that. There are highly trained, there are highly trained units and in fact in uh, the Department of Justice we do not really have large numbers of uh, units that are trained to deal with civil disturbances. I know a lot of people may be looking back on history, think we can call on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of U.S. Marshals, and that's simply not the case. Our Marshals uh, Response Force is approximately 100 U.S. Marshals. And so historically, when there have been emergencies where we have to respond with people who do have experience in these kinds of emergencies, they're highly trained people. We use uh, what are called SORT teams uh, response teams from the Bureau of Prisons. And I could see a number of, uh, now in the federal system, we don't wear badges with our name, I mean, the agents don't wear badges in their names and stuff like that, which many civilian police agents, I mean, uh, non-federal police agencies do. Uh, and uh, I could and uh, I could understand why some of these individuals simply wouldn't want to talk to people about who they are, if that were, if that in fact was the case. What, I'll take the next question. Our next question comes from Sandy Berman with Wall Street Journal. Please go ahead. Sandy, your line is open now. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi there. Um, hoping you can explain how exactly you coordinate the National Guard deployments and movements in and around Washington uh, with those of various federal law enforcement agencies. Uh, is it you who communicates the orders to them, and how does that work? No, well, it, it largely depends who they're, who they're supporting at that time. Uh, some of the National Guard uh, were supporting the Metropolitan Police Department, and some of them would be out uh, beyond uh, the White House perimeter uh, working the streets with uh, MPD. So they would be tactically attached there. Uh, others, uh, we, we asked the National Guard uh, to protect federal monuments, and so a number of the 
the units, maybe even, well, I won't speculate about the majority, but a lot of the units were uh, dispersed around the city to protect uh, federal monuments or particular federal uh, facilities. Uh, those that were uh, within the White House uh, area uh, and were part of uh, protecting uh, the, the White House and, and Lafayette Park area uh, were, were, at the, were under the direction of the tactical commanders in that area. But in terms of requesting the resources and asking for their assistance, uh, that was ultimately my responsibility of, of uh, ensuring that the National Guard uh, that we needed to support law enforcement and support the district uh, were brought to bear. Next question. Yes, sir. Our next question comes from Katie Benner with New York Times. Please go ahead. Hi, Mr. Attorney General. Thank you so much for doing this press conference. I have two questions, but the most important is probably I'd like to ask you about your thoughts on police abuse of power. Last year at a law enforcement conference, you said that such abuse reflected fat apples more than systemic breakdowns. But today you said George Floyd's death is not the first of its kind. While the vast majority of officers do their jobs bravely and righteously, it's undeniable that many African Americans lack confidence in the criminal justice system. So has your thinking on whether we're looking at a systemic issue or not shifted over time? No, uh, <clears throat> my views ha haven't shifted recently. The uh, and and what I what you quoted, I, I think, is is consistent. And, and you were addressing, you know, the use of excessive force. Is that right, Katie? Is that what you were addressing, or are you, were you talking? Yes, more? excessive force, the, the police abuse. Yes. Yeah, uh, I, I I do think that uh, that uh, those who engage in the in, in excessive uh, force. Uh, that involves, you know, the remember federal um, civil rights laws address willful uh, use of excessive force, and those that engage in that kind of activity, I think, are uh, a distinct minority. And uh, I think the overwhelming number of police officers uh, try conscientiously uh, to uh, to uh, use appropriate and reasonable force. And then my second question was just, it seems that we're ratcheting up in the district the tools and the power of the federal response, giving DEA, BOP, for example, the power to make arrests. I'm wondering why that's happening now, because it seems that the streets have been relatively calm and there's no curfew tonight. Uh, and I think that decision was made by the mayor because she has confidence that we've sort of returned to order. Well, well actually, um, I, after assessing the situation last night toward the, uh, toward the end of the uh, evening, that is late in, or maybe early in the morning, um, I felt that we, we could afford to collapse uh, per, our perimeter and, uh, and uh, uh, eliminate some of the, uh, the checkpoints and so forth and, and take a little bit of a, a, a more uh, uh, low profile footprint for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, I think that uh, we have seen piece, uh, the, uh, a sharp reduction in violent episodes and, and, and peaceful demonstrations. And our hope and expectation is that those will continue. Uh, and also because we now have on hand uh, sufficient uh, resources, we feel, to deal with, with uh, that contingency if it if, if violence increases. Uh, so I, I do think that uh, over the weekend and certainly at the beginning of this week, we had a phenomenon around the country with a number of cities getting extremely violent. Uh, a lot of uh, officers have been uh, hurt around the country, a lot of uh, victims, a lot of property damage. And as I said, uh, on Sunday, uh, it was probably the peak of violence in DC. And on, on Monday, we were still facing very large demonstrations that were belligerent and throwing projectiles, although, although the evening ultimately uh, ended uh, more peaceably. So uh, I, as, I, as I told the governors on Monday, it's very important in, uh, to, to use sufficient forces, law enforcement, to uh, establish law and order in a city when you have riots running. If you use insufficient 
resources, it's dangerous for everybody. It's dangerous for the officers. It's dangerous for the protesters. It's dangerous for uh, the population uh, because things can easily get out of control and you lose control of events. That's what riots are. And uh, the way to address it is to make sure the resources are there and that people understand the resources are there uh, to deal with that kind of violence. And I think once that occurred, it provided an environment where things could quiet down, and they did quiet down, and hopefully they will stay quieted down. Next. Okay. I think that was it. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate everyone's attendance. Thank you. And, and I, again, want to appreciate uh, the, the hard work done by all the men and women in the Department of Justice and the, and the Justice Department components uh, and their leaders. Thank you. Thank you all for attending.